Hello, everybody. My name is Oliver Lash, and I'm the author of the textbook Principles of Management, Practicing Ethics, Responsibility, and Sustainability. And uh, this session will about the communicating or communication chapter of the textbook. Uh, and we will focus on the idea of talking. So the connection between talk and walk and how we as managers uh, cannot only get um, truth or messages across, but actually change the reality through those messages. This is the underlying idea. Um, this session is in particular recorded uh, as a dedication to uh, the students uh, at the Higher School of Economics in uh, Moscow and uh, their lecturer Ekaterina uh, Ivanova, who has kindly invited me to give this, uh, this guest lecture. So let's have a close look at what's going to happen here. Good, there we are. So the, the idea in this book is really that um, we, we as managers, we actually are continuously shifting between different modes. Uh, so different modes of the practice of management. And one of those main modes really is communicating together with others like strategizing, organizing. There's another one I call fall leading, so leading and following um, and so on. So the idea is that communicating is one of those very, very important modes. And in this particular session, we will focus on one sub part of that chapter, which is uh, centered on two of the learning goals. The first one is to uh, how to communicate your uh, activities, your responsible management activities effectively. So how to make sure people get the message, but also how to use communication in order to create new responsible management realities. So to make something happen in a certain way. So let's have a look at an example. And this is the uh, example of the company Hire and uh, their CEO, Zhang Rimin. Um, Hire is a white goods uh, uh, producing company, so household uh, electronics, uh, anything from air conditioning to uh, uh, dishwashers. And they are, uh, although it's a very mature industry, a very progressive company and their management is one of the driving forces. Um, have a look at uh, what they call the Rundan uh, Hei. I hope I got it close to right in the, the pronunciation there, um, which is their management system itself, which they uh, uh, attribute much of their success to. But one of the key aspects of it is the communication. So uh, it is not only uh, Zhang Ruimin being a very, very uh, um, uh, kind of impressive speaker on the stage, as you've seen before. You see him listening there as well. That's also part of communication, but also it is about all of the other people, managers, or other in other roles in the organization, um, making communication happen. So you cannot separate out that one person's communication from everybody else's, just as you cannot uh, separate out the communication of a man manager, for instance, in, uh, in marketing of hire from the rest of the company's communication. It is that uh, uh, kind of cacophony, that kind of mixture of voices, which is meant to send one message that's at least consistent. Um, but also it's things communicating. So what you have on the screen on uh, at your trade show, for instance, or also what your products do or don't do is communication. And we will have a close look at that in that chapter. And you might think, well, yeah, well, communication is just talk. So as a manager, I meant to do things, right? But uh, even eminent management thinkers like Henry Minsberg, one of the, or probably the uh, greatest management thinkers still alive, um, he says that the managerial job is almost exclusively talking and listening. So this means communication, which consists of both talking and listening, is extremely important at the very core of what every manager does. And this idea of modes of management is very much inspired by Henry Minsberg thinking, who talked about um, different roles that managers uh, assume when they're working, when they're practicing management. Now let's talk about a, a more practice-oriented example, not coming from an academic, but rather from uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the probably most, uh, uh, the best known CEOs around the world, Mark Zuckerberg. Um, I started this place, I run it, I am responsible for what happens here. So those are clear, clear words. So connecting your own responsibility through communication 
to that place that you are in charge of. And it might well be that your place is, or it's likely to be that your place is a little bit smaller or of a different nature than the place that is Facebook. But it could be a small team of two people. It might be the part of performance that you as a manager are responsible for or a particular KPI. Um, or it might be um, the, the location of the company, uh, let's say a retail outlet that you're running. You're responsible for what happened there. So you are one of the main voices that will be heard. And this is why communication is so extremely important and getting it right is so uh, extremely important. So you don't want to have a, have a scandal at that scale or even smaller hiccups in your communication, for instance, with, with data and privacy as it happened in Facebook. So that's this communication mode of management or the mode of communicating. So you want this to be effective and effective can be two different things at least. Uh, so the first one is to get the message through. So you want to be understood. And ideally that message should be a truthful message. We have a set of principles of effective communication in the chapter as well. And truthfulness is one of them. Uh, but also it can be effective in a different way. It can be effective because it affects with an A, reality. It changes reality. Or it could affect reality in maintaining a certain reality. So communication can do both. Um, so the idea is that if we're using that power of communication to communicate certain realities and to affect, to change reality and realities um, to a good, to a, for a good purpose, and this is what we mean with professional communication. On the one hand, to um, communicate um, in, with professional conduct, so not lying, not misrepresenting, not greenwashing. Um, um, all, all of those are principles of a... Um, a professional, ethical, or responsible type of communication in their conduct. But also then the question is, what do you do with your communication? What's the out output and the outcome out of the communication where you're actually changing realities? Um, so how can you fulfill a positive role in society as a manager? And what role does communication have in that? Um, so a positive role, just as other professions like um, uh, nurses and doctors and firefighters, policemen, and so on. What can that positive role for manager be? And I think it's quite an easy uh, translation from those other professions to, to the managerial profession, because if you are somebody who, for instance, works in the, 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 the food um, supply chain that uh, finally ends up on our table anywhere, what you're doing literally gets food on our table. If you're somewhere in construction industry, you're giving people shelter. So some of the most basic um, needs that we have in societies are being fulfilled by managers. If you're in the public sector, you're making sure that citizens are actually being served. So once again, one of the, uh, one of the most basic functions that we could have. Of course, there's also rather unprofessional um, areas of management. So if you are in, uh, in uh, let's, let's say you're in Instagram, for instance, and uh, your, um, your, your role is to increase the click uh, because somebody the clicks because somebody paid for it so, so to help them create a certain type of type of content well most likely you're not really realizing their professional role so very much it also depends on where you want to go and communication if you are in a place where you can assume that role is really really crucial so the chapter is um uh, is divided up and it's funny I just noticed this is a broken record so I don't want to sound like a broken record although I often do but um, the, the idea is that we have those four areas um, that are really important for your, uh, for your communication as a manager so there's talking first of all talking is the combination between talk and walk where we talked about that so the combination between action and, uh, um, and, uh, and saying between doings and sayings between the reality and what you say about it. Um, so this is what we will focus on. But then um, there's also stakeholder communication. So communicating with all of the different um, groups and people and non-human stakeholders that somehow have a relationship to you as a manager or that you're interested in as a manager. Uh, integrative communication to combine all of the different communication channels um, in order to send one consistent message ideally or a customized set of messages to different stakeholders. But either way, to do that in an integrative way by managing all of the communicators. And uh, then the last one is really about good communication. So how do I communicate ethically? How do you communicate uh, um, 
in a way that allows stakeholders to participate and to co-create realities. Um, so this is the idea that we will focus on the first one, talking with just a little bit of the second one that is about stakeholders. So talking, communication and action. Um, the idea is that uh, we're never only talking and we're never only acting. Um, it is always a combination of the two of them. The way we move communicates something. Um, the tool we use communicates something. Uh, but conversely, while we're speaking, um, at the same time, we are always doing something as well because our talk does things. Our talk can, for instance, confirm some, something somebody else has, has just said or ask somebody else to do something. So we cannot separate those two out. Although there's this very interesting lens, conceptual lens of decoupling where people try to somehow disconnect the two of them in a very active way. So where what you're doing actually is very different from what you're saying. And one of the forms that, is, that uh, decoupling happens is greenwashing. We'll talk about that um, just now. So one of my favorite examples of greenwashing is really the framing uh, um, of, of clean coal, to talk about clean coal. Look, we're going to do clean coal. Um, I've, I've looked into it for a couple of times now, and um, every time I find some advanced form of using coal for energy production, it's never clean. It can't ever be clean. Of course, it's less dirty than it used to be, but it's never clean. And still, it is always a, a type of CO2 emitting activity. So it's not a, um, a, re, a renewable type of energy. It is burning fossil fuels and uh, emitting CO2 into the air. So clean coal is something that you're trying to make people believe, but that doesn't exist. So and um, then you get into those situations like here in South Africa, where the company, uh, uh, the energy company Cecil is being called out on their projects of producing clean coal. Um, so those two ladies over there are actually actively approaching the two executives from, from Sassol and handing over uh, their, their manifesto about what they think uh, Sassol should be doing and how bad it is to, uh, to try to, to rebrand coal in that way. And this reminds us that um, uh, communication is, is always a back and forth, a back and forth. It's not a one way message sending. It's a complex um, system of communicative actions which together make the larger message. And this larger message has many different sides depending on where you are in time, at which point you look at a communication uh, or an exchange, and also where you are uh, in terms of your preconceived perceptions of the topic. Um, so this is the idea that communication is this very complex thing. And one of the, um, the and, and it creates conflicts in a certain way as well, because of those different perspectives on it. And greenwashing is one of those conflicts where what you're doing in the sustainability, responsibility or ethics sense is not, uh, is way less or worse than what you're communicating to be doing. So this is what we call greenwashing. There's this imbalance. Um, there's also, so originally it comes from, uh, from the Tom Sawyer novels where you're whitewashing um, a fence. Um, so, so the connection has been made, but also we've heard about pink washing when it comes to the breast cancer cause or blue washing when it comes to the UN uh, principles, uh, uh, sorry, for the UN Global Compact, where you, uh, because the UN's color is green. So uh, the idea there is there, there really is that there's this imbalance between walk and talk, and it's a negative imbalance where you're walking less than you're talking. Uh, and that might actually be a good thing sometimes, although it sounds like, yes, um, it's a form of lying and, and it sure is, or at least of misrepresentation. Um, but at the same time, there's positive aspects to it because typically we have that uh, greenwash trapdoor and it's quite nicely uh, represented here. If you look at the, um, the, the one on the left, so where it just says just greenwash. So if you are in your uh, increasing uh, activities, responsibility, sustainability, ethics activities, make the mistake to communicate more than you're actually doing. So this is the, this is the two axes, stakeholder value created on, on the, uh, the vertical and on the horizontal one intensity of communication. So if you're talking more uh, um, than you're doing, well, you might very rightfully be accused of, uh, of greenwash. So what happens once you're being called out on that, like the ex executives at Cecil? Um, well, you are actually very, very visibly being lowered in terms of uh, the trust people have for you. And at the same time, whatever you do afterwards, you have to do double or, or threefold 
um, in terms of responsibility, sustainability, and ethics, because people never really believe you're really doing as much as you're doing. So why is that good? Because it actually raises the bar for any company who's ever been caught greenwashing. Think about BP, British Petroleum, for instance. They try to rebrand themselves as beyond petroleum quite a couple of years ago, where they clearly weren't beyond petroleum, just as they're, as they're not today. Um, and BP has, has been doing a lot, and they can never, never really get it right, because they have that very, very high bar already from that big greenwashing scandal. So what do you want to do? You want to move go around it. And um, the, the probably most uh, wise way of doing this is move from that low balance where you're doing very little and you're talking very little um, about those topics to a shy communication strategy where you're already doing a lot, uh, but you're not talking a lot about it yet because you don't want yourself uh, uh, to be in a position where uh, people start questioning your claims and maybe somebody finds something that didn't quite work out and, and you're being accused of greenwash. And then you move on to a high balance where once you're actually very mature in your, your activities, then you start talking about it a lot. So this is the idea to go around it. Um, and often what we see in practice is actually that uh, we have, have a different kind of uh, pathway. So we go from low balance uh, for some companies to greenwashing and they, they get all scared. They were like, oh, no, 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 I shouldn't have done that. Uh, and they stop talking about what they're doing. But at the same time, they're doing more and more and more. So they move from greenwash to shy, but they're often never able to get back to high balance just because of that depth that they have because of the, the, the past scandal. So this is one, how do you walk? I mean, where do you, where do you move in a certain way with your communication from which style to which style? But the other one is also important to know when you're greenwashing. And um, there's many different forms of greenwashing. So you already know what, what greenwashing not is, uh, uh, what, what it isn't. Um, and this is what we have up here, the successful responsibility communication. So you are creating a lot of stakeholder value, you're doing really well. And at the same time, you're very effective in getting it across. So this is what, where you wanna be. But then again, there's those three other points on, uh, on that graph where you are actually greenwashing in different ways. Um, so the first one would be uh, the greenwash noise. So you are actually communicating um, while you're doing very little. And uh, the effectiveness of that communication is very low. Um, so for instance, you are um, starting to, to change the color of all of your product packagings to green. So you're expressing in a certain way, okay, so that might be more sustainable or you paint a tree onto it. Um, but at the same time, you're not really um, communicating clearly what that means. And you're not, uh, you're, you're not either showing that you're actually doing very little. So you're already misrepresenting and uh, in, in a very ambiguous way. Um, and then we have what we, what we usually think about when we, when we think about greenwash. And this is the unsubstantiated greenwash. So you're doing very little still, but you're actually claiming in a very effective way, sending a beautifully crafted, very clear message about all the stuff you're doing, which you're actually not doing. Um, so this might be, for instance, the, the, the scandal that came up just about a week ago, I think, um, about the labeling of, um, uh, of fibers that have been recycled from plastic bottles. Um, so I, I myself, for instance, caught, uh, uh, caught a small, uh, 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 bought a small uh, small box um, for for food uh, that said 100% um, plastic bottle recycled at uh, the local Tesco here, one of the local supermarkets. Um, so now I, I actually doubt about it because the the scandal, the uh, the report that caused the scandal said that only a very very minor percentage of those are actually um, recycled from plastic bottles. So if it says it on that back, it's 100% from plastic bottles very clear message, and it's not at all, this is what we call unsubstantiated greenwash. So your claim is not substantiated, it's not based in a, a reality, it's a lie. Um, and then there's misperceived greenwash, and this is where you are actually doing great things. So for instance, your um, your uh, that, that very same box that I bought, it would be entirely made from recycled uh, 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 bottles, and you claim that, but you're actually right next to, to the claim. You have that, uh, that, that picture of a bottle swimming in, uh, in, in the ocean. So you are, in a way, implicitly communicating that this is not consumer uh, recollected 
uh, bottle sea recycling, but you actually did something else as well, that you were cleaning up the environment. Uh, but in reality, none of your bottles come uh, come from an ocean cleanup uh, let, uh, or, or, or even a, a cleanup of any other ecosystem. So you are communicating poorly. Your, uh, your, your stakeholder value creation is actually high because doing uh, that recycling and uh, having something that entirely comes from PET PET bottles, great, great stakeholder value created, but at the same time, uh, you're just silly and, and, and stupid in communicating it by putting that image right next to it. So this, those are the different types of greenwash we could think about. Um, and we are at the intersection now from moving from um, the, uh, the, the greenwashing kind of a negative communication topic to one that, that can be quite positive, which is performative communication, creating new realities by communicating. And um, it's, uh, but, but, but here's a warning in, in there. Um, because performative communication can also be negative. So for instance, if you think about Donald Trump's very famous uh, statement that he said as a, while being a president, well, maybe, just maybe if you insect, uh, uh, um, if you uh, uh, put Lysol, a, a, a disinfecting agent into your bloodstream, just maybe it, uh, uh, it kills the, the COVID, uh, 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 COVID in your bloodstream as well, and you're gonna, you're gonna be healed. Um, so right, right after that, very, very quickly, that, that could be, have been performative in one of the worst ways ever. People could have died by, by doing that. Um, I don't know if some people did die by doing it, I'm not sure. But um, Lysel, the, uh, uh, the, the producer of that product, very, very quickly um, counter-communicated and uh, sent the message that you don't insect inject Lysel. Do not do that by any, by any means. It's not a good idea and it's very, very dangerous. Um, so you see, once again, it's a back and forth uh, that makes the communication episodes, which we are uh, episodes which, which we are evaluating, um, and we are trying to move from a performative way of creating new realities. In this case, there could have been people who died; that would be the new reality, uh, to creating positive new realities, and that's what we call performative communication: creating realities or affecting reality by communicating. Um, so the idea is that this is talk that makes the walk, if you want so. So it's not reporting something we're doing already. It's meant to change what we're doing. And uh, the other perspective on that is what we call communicative, uh, communicative constitution of organization, CCO, uh, which takes the stance that any organization we're working in as managers actually is made up of communication. It's not something the organization does, but the other way uh, around that uh, communication does the organization. So the, the organization itself is an outcome of communication, of course, moves communication uh, into a very prominent position. And there's many different ways of um, how texts, for instance, can, uh, can uh, uh, change reality. So assertives, for instance, um, are statements that say, and I wanna give you that example, which is from back from my time in Mexico, you walk into a lobby and in this case of an automotive producing uh, company and says, we are an equal opportunity workplace. Big, big letters, everybody sees it. And everybody sees it coming in uh, every day to work and everybody visiting the company sees it. Um, so this asserts a certain reality um, and it makes it very difficult to move away from that reality as well once it is there. So it, stabilizes that reality if it is one of that equal opportunity workplace and all of the practices that relate to it. Um, then we have commissives as well. Um, commissives are uh, texts that, uh, text that bind uh, actors to do something. Um, they commit the actors to doing something. Um, so for instance, you might have a memorandum of understanding between um, two, um, uh, two, two partners in trade or a, uh, a more formal contract between you and your employees. Um, those are commissives. Or you might have directives as well. And this, those are the ones that authorize or ban action. Um, so if you are a company that has uh, subscribed to net positive, uh, some kind of net po positive CO2, uh, emissions performance, uh, maybe by 2030, as many have, well, most likely you might be banned from using certain fuels. If you are the logistics manager uh, in, uh, in one of the branches, for instance, you might not be able to buy a car that uses fossil fuel. You might have to use uh, an electric or maybe a, 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 a hydrogen engine even. Um, so this is the idea that uh, those kind of texts actually can do things, uh, but also translates into 
your personal stakeholder communication strategies or stakeholder communication practices. Traditionally, um, we think about information strategy. So I tell you something and I want you to, to believe it and to love me for it. Uh, the typical PR type of strategy. You don't want to hear a lot back. You just want to convince people. Um, but then also there's the response strategy. And this is one we, uh, there's barely any information strategy that you can run nowadays. Information communication practice are almost impossible in, in most of our societies uh, because we are so connected. We are, everybody has so much strong access to communication, to being heard and to making themselves heard. Um, so the response is the more natural uh, uh, way of communication that we see most of the times where you're actually sending a message out and you have to take the message back in as well. And from that back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you, sh you, you shape a joint message that finally somehow stabilizes and people understand as the message or the truth. Um, and then there's the involvement strategy. So both of the ones that you see up there, the co-creation and involvement are both kinds of strategies that make something happen. Um, so, and uh, the, the idea, idea there is that the involvement strategy, you're actually channeling that response from your stakeholder into a certain space, into a certain type of content or a certain type of topic. And a good example is, uh, I, I believe it was the company Total, an uh, uh, Italian energy company, um, which had a, a student ambassador and student innovation competition at universities. So they were asking students actively to give them ideas for how they could do business differently. Uh, and many of those, those activities were in order to green them as an energy business. Um, so they were telling students what they wanted to hear about this stakeholder, this particular stakeholder, what they wanted to hear about. And while doing so, um, in a way, they were also channeling other types of communication to say, well, we want to hear about this. So let's let's all be in that space together. And they would actually do some of the things that those uh, those students would suggest, though it creates new realities. So it is a type of performative communication. Uh, a performative communication strategy, if you want, so a practice. And then we have co-creation as another type of performative um, uh, communication strategy you can use as managers. And uh, I promised you to get back to, to hire at some point in time. And uh, hire is the perfect example of one of communication episode at, at hire, which we studied is the perfect example for that, which is when a uh, young father from Beijing um, realizes that his, uh, his son, I believe, had... Uh, had problems with the, the very much polluted air and that the, the uh, existing air, air, uh, um, air conditioners and air filters actually were not really suited to the needs of a little child. So he went on that, first he went on social media saying that, then he went on a, a vertical social media platform, so a, a private platform if you want so, that higher created, which is um, uh, a, a co-creation space, if you want so, where he actually could work with other stakeholders and with actual engineers and managers from higher in order to co-design and make a reality a uh, combined uh, air conditioner and air filter, uh, which had particular functions for little children in order to actually create that product and to create that new reality. Uh, not only the product as a new reality, but also that new reality that there was actually an option then for children to, to live in that more healthy and, and to be in that more healthy environment in their homes. So a great example, I think. Um, a, uh, a little bit less positive example is, uh, and, and, it, and it calls, uh, um, it, it is a reminder if you want, so for us to make sure we understand not only that, that kind of human-centric uh, communication uh, as, as the only reality there, no, that actually machines, things, systems communicate as well. We're not always in charge of what's being said, even if it's being said on our behalf, such as in this case. When I was um, looking for, for a case for the supply chain management chapter on child labor, what I, I was putting that into this en engine, which is called Ecosia, check it out, it's really, really great. Um, and what, what do I get? An ad from eBay. And it says child labor on eBay. Fantastic prices on child labor. I'm sure this is not what, what anybody at eBay wanted to be communicated, that they're actually selling child labor and they're even doing so at very cheap prices. Although de facto it might be truth because true because many of our products unfortunately are still produced with the help of child labor. Um, but, but you see, this is what I mean, that 
um, communication is uh, is something that comes out of that very complex system of things and people and systems and messages and certain times where certain messages go through more easily in times where they don't. So it's this very, very complex thing, which makes it so interesting as well. And uh, be, before I, I go over to the summary, I want to tell you one more thing, which goes along the same same lines, because often um, you, you think communication needs to be explicit. It's me saying something or writing something, like in this case. But often it's also the implicit communication, the physical communication of a certain setting. And I give you an example that just happened an hour ago. Um, so I bought a sewing machine, yay. Uh, not the most uh, manly thing to do if you uh, if you believe in traditional gender stereotypes, but uh, I think it's really important for uh, for repair and I want to live a sustainable life. Um, so uh, I go over to Aldi because they had one um, and, uh, uh, and and I'm looking for it, looking for it, looking for it, cannot find it. Um, and then in the last moment I notice, oh, it's right next to the nursing bra and it's right next to um, all, all of the toys for children. Oh, and it's right next to some uh, feminine hygiene products. Okay, I wouldn't have looked there. And what, what did that do? Well, if I wouldn't have, have insisted, well, I would actually have been through that setup of the store, the physical setup, the, which is a form of communication, um, I would actually have been channeled to staying in my typical male gender stereotypes of, uh, yeah, well, I'm buying an angle grinder and a couple of screws, which I did buy as well, um, and, and nothing else. So I'm the, 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 the guy who's like banging on things and repairing things. And then there's the woman who's sewing things and taking care of the children. Um, so we, and that's an important topic because it's an equality topic, which, which is one of the main cares that we have in responsible management. So even how you set up a, a shop and the very, you might say mundane decision of where you put something and next to what you put something communicates and creates realities. And with that example, let me quickly summarize what we did. So we're looking for professional communication that is both professional in conduct, so ethical, respons uh, ethically, responsibly, and sustainably communicating, but also in the outcome to assume some kind of positive role in society. Uh, and one of the outcomes might be that you create a new reality, for instance, one where uh, it is normal for, uh, for, for men to do many of the things that women do and vice versa. Um, Effective management communication needs both being able to get the message across, or maybe it's rather an efficient communication because you don't lose anything of your communication content. Um, and at the same time, effectiveness in the sense of affecting with an A reality, changing reality through communication. And uh, shaping effective messages is at the core of both of them. And we have a set of principles you can use in order to do that. And then uh, good communication. So, so you notice this is already the parts of the chapter that we haven't talked about, but I would like you to, to, to know that they're there. Good communication, we uh, have ideal speech situations where you are creating a communication where all stakeholders can have their voices heard. And it's likely that we get a fair outcome independently of how powerful one communicator is uh, versus the other one. And then there's nonviolent communication where we're trying to communicate in a way that avoids conflicts or eases them. And then we talked a lot about twalk, uh, talking, so talking and walking and their, their dynamics. And one of those was greenwashing, where you are talking much, much more than you're walking in different forms. And the other one was performative communication, where ideally you're actually changing reality to the better through communication. Um, and other things that we haven't talked about, but once again, they're important, have a look at them, is stakeholder communication. So stakeholder communication needs knowing your stakeholders first. Uh, it needs certain stakeholder communication patterns. We looked at those four, you remember, um, and, and knowing when, which pattern is the most adequate one. And of course, it needs the integration of all of your messages. If you are the retailer, which was Aldi in this case, um, if you are committed to gender equality uh, in, your, in your organization structures, and maybe you have it in your CSR report, well, this is something that also needs to run through the way how you position products in your store. Um, good. And then I want to show you just a couple of more things that are in the chapter in case you're interested in. This is uh, Francois Corin, um, really, really great guy. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the godfathers probably of uh, constitutive communication of organization. Really interesting um, interview with him and where he, where he talks in depth about the different dynamics of how organizations are actually made through communication. Um, if you want to see it more in practice, there's uh, Thomas Hügli, who is the chief communication and uh, CR officer for a uh, big insurance company. Um, if you want to have a 
true, although it's saying fairy tale here, a true story, which is anonymized um, about this. Uh, so I, I think I called this, uh, this person, uh, maybe Alexandra or something like this, or Rebecca, I'm not sure. Uh, so it's anonymized, but a true story of how complex communication can be often, but also even if you're in a, just in a normal managerial role, how you can change reality. So have a, have a very close look at this one. Then uh, all, all of these sections and all of the chapters, the true stories and the, the interviews, and also uh, what is in, a, in each of the chapter is a digging deeper section where you wanna go in depth into a particular topic, in this case, uh, web communication. And then each chapter also has this worksheet. In this case, it's a worksheet about uh, nonviolent communication, ping pong, I call it. So ping pong is my invention. Nonviolent communication is something that's been there for a long time. So the idea uh, to, to practice your messaging. So how you frame messages in order to engage in a communication that uh, uh, avoids or, or eases conflict. So there's much, much more out there on communication as you see on that image. So please do have a close look at, uh, at the book chapter. And if you're interested, um, also subscribe to the channel. There should be somewhere here, here maybe uh, a button where you can subscribe to the channel of that book. So every time that I'm posting a new video related to the book, you actually know about that. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm out and I'm very much looking forward to either engaging with you folks if you're sitting in Moscow in, uh, in the class to, uh, uh, to engage in our discussion section or if you're somebody outside that class watching that video, please feel free to drop me a line either on LinkedIn or, or also down here on YouTube and uh, let's be in touch. Thank you very much for listening.